Next is one of my favorite people because he's dedicated himself to solving Georgia's transportation problems. And since I'm from Georgia, um, and, and, and Baruch Feigenbaum of the Reason Foundation lives in Georgia, he has a personal interest in solving problems in Georgia. And I know that for most of you from your states, you understand that it's great to have all these wonderful national experts come into your state, come into your community and talk about your problems. But there is nothing like a homegrown expert to, imp to impress your legislators, to impress your elected officials because of the personal experience and the vested interest. So Baruch Feigenbaum has been working on the transportation, mobility, and congestion problems in Metro Atlanta. Um, he has a, an excellent blog on uh, the Reason Foundation um, website as well. And he has worked um, on Capitol Hill for one of Georgia's own legislators, uh, a representative, a, a congressman, Representative uh, Lynn Westmoreland, who is uh, widely respected in Georgia. He has his master's degree in city and regional planning with a concentration in transportation from Georgia Tech. So he is totally Georgia grown, Georgia based, and we're very proud to have him here. Um, and Baruch is going to be talking about free market transportation and solutions. Come on up, Baruch, thank you. My goodness, uh, I need to thank Benita for that wonderful uh, introduction and uh, slide her a 20 after this presentation for all those nice things she said about me. Okay, so a little bit about this presentation. What this is, is at the Reason Foundation, and many of you know Sam Staley and Bob Hool, both in the room here, we have a, proj a project, or I guess a program we should call the Galvin Mobility Program, which is looking at metro areas across the country and solving, or at least attempting to solve, the congestion and mobility problems in those areas. So what I'm basing this presentation today on is an update study uh, to Atlanta, one that Bob first did in 2006 and one that I updated earlier this year. And what I'm trying to do here is take it sort of those concepts on a nationwide basis and say, okay, your city obviously is not exactly like Atlanta, but what can you learn from this presentation? What can you do? What principles can be applied? We've heard a lot of great topics in terms of the federal level, how to fix federal problems, and obviously there is somewhat of a federal role in transportation, but on the other hand, we also all live in states and local communities, and because of federalism in this country, the federal government only does certain things. We need, and I would argue want, the states to do some of those other transportation responsibilities. So let me go ahead and get started. Let me just look at my notes here, see if there's anything I missed. Okay, I don't think so. So, there we go. Okay, so there's basically a brief presentation summary. Uh, you can see, actually, you'll excuse me, I'm just gonna get my, my laptop here, because I don't have my glasses with me, and I realize that you can probably see that a lot better than I can. And uh, so, you know, you might be wondering, wait a minute, he didn't actually talk about that. So let me just slide this up here a minute. Second. Okay, so you can see a, a basic presentation summary. Um, basically, the concept and the plans are going to require freeway improvements, arterial improvements, some intelligent transportation systems, even looking at a transit network, Art Gazzetti's there in the back, uh, because this is a plan for the entire metro area. And obviously, we're trying to do this from a market focus. We're trying to make this as user pay, user benefit friendly as possible. Okay, so on the, on the market-based transportation concept, we have a few things that we're trying to do. We're focusing on creating a network of highways and transit, but we're trying to have everyone pay as much of the full cost of these trips as possible, and that's for highways and for transit. When I looked at the Atlanta plan, and I think when we try to do other cities, we want to have a regional focus, not a corridor focus. Those of you who work with MPOs, the metro planning organizations, I feel sometimes they have too much of a corridor focus and are just looking at improving one road and not actually working with their travel demand models to try to get people from point A to point B. Oh, maybe that's my cue to move on. I don't know. 
<laughs> let's, let's go ahead and look at the uh, various congestion sources. And so, again, taking some Atlanta examples, but what you have are basically your freeway bottlenecks. So we have something like I-285 at Georgia 400. If you're familiar with Virginia, there was a bottleneck at I-495 and 95 down in Fairfax County that they actually worked. And these bottlenecks are the primary, primary issues in terms of congestion on the freeway network, lost time, lost productivity. And so they're one of the major things you want to look at. We also looked at some modest freeway additions. And when I say freeway, I mean non-priced. Now, we at the Reason Foundation really like tolling and that sort of, because we think it's the most efficient, much more efficient than, say, the gas tax or a lot of other. But there are some, there are some and, and I should add, with that tolling, also managed lanes where you have variable pricing. I should add, there are a few freeways in Atlanta and probably in your communities as well that, for whatever the reason, you might need to do some general purpose free capacity as well. So we should put that in. Talked a little bit about managed, lane, managed toll lanes. And one of the things that we wanted to do uh, in Atlanta and in most major cities, certainly those over 4 million in the metro area, and you can even go down to places with 1 million plus just a smaller network, is a managed lane network in terms of making sure that when you're going from one corridor to another corridor, you can actually get there. One managed lane in isolation is very nice, but if you're not going from one end to the other of that corridor, when you get to the end, you're going to be stuck in the same traffic as everyone else, and it hasn't really done a heck of a lot for you. So I talked a little bit about the freeway widenings. I just want to talk a little bit about induced demand, what it is and what it isn't. So induced demand is a concept that we can say people probably on the left uh, came up with where they said, well, wait a minute, if you add all these non-priced lanes, aren't you going to have – you're just going to have congestion occur again because you have more lanes, you know, you're going to induce more travel. And so my response to that is, in certain situations, that's true. Oh, thank you. I advance it on my, I don't necessarily advance it. In certain situations, in certain situations, that's true, but actually you're also having growth. So actually more traffic on those new lanes is really what you want if you're in a growing economic area. So um, I, I, I sort of tend to counter that. I work with, um, some more planners than I think many of you do, and so it's often helpful if I speak their language so I can sort of make sure that we're on the same page. All right, this is a general map, and again, I realize this is Atlanta-specific focus, but it's similar to a lot of metro areas. You see you've got your perimeter beltway there, and you've got your outer roads. And you can see, again, there is a minor amount here of new general purpose capacity. Again, most of these roads were based on where managed lanes were planning to go, how many lanes they had, what the state DOT was willing to do, room, all the rest of it. It's actually more unpriced capacity than I would like, uh, but because of the plans in Atlanta, that's what we chose to go with. Um, again, the managed lanes came out of an original vision, which were hub lanes. And those of you who have been around for a while know a lot about high occupancy vehicle lanes. We had them in, in northern Virginia, and they're now actually being converted to hot. Uh, I like to say that the, the problem with the hub lanes is what I like to call the Goldilocks theory. And someone asked me what this is and where I came up with it um, and suggested I think of something else. But I kind of like it, so we're going to go with it. And what it is is their hot lane, hub lanes are either too hot or too cold. When they're too hot, you've got too many people using them. They slow down. They offer no advantage over the general purpose lanes. When they're too cold, no one uses them. And you're like, what is this perfectly good lane doing here? It's just a complete waste of space. Why can't I use it? I want to use it. I don't have two people in my car. This is very annoying. So because of that, we've transitioned to these priced managed lanes where you pay a variable toll based on time of day, based on congestion. Most of the ones that we recommend are free for buses and super carpools, which are usually van pools seven or more only. There are some situations where they're free for three-person carpools or something. We tend to discourage that because when you start adding a lot of these lower carpools in, you often have got no room. And one of the ideas of this network is it doesn't only help highways, it helps your transit buses as well. So we try to discourage that. And as you can see, as you can see, there we go. This is the map we came up with Atlanta, and because of the various situations, we had to do two lanes in some places. One lane's reversible, not reversible. Some of this was based on what the GDOT plans were. So again, trying to work with our partners. But you can see this is pretty comprehensive. 
We also had a, um, a new tunnel uh, under Atlanta, which is a bit controversial, but for traffic reasons, we wanted to go ahead and, and include it. All right, there's been quite a bit of um, discussion of PPPs already, and there'll be more, so I don't really want to go into it too, into much detail, but basically, the public-private partnerships are an important part in terms of financing this, and also in terms of being able to leverage that for resources. And they're, they're important agreements. Uh, it's important to do them correctly. There's obviously various types. There's the full DBFOM. You've got concessions. You've got avail availability payments. But one of the things we find is that there's often some myths regarding PPPs. So I, I don't want to go into it too much, but I know it was, it was something that a question that um, Bob actually had earlier this morning about parallel roads. And we had a big issue in Atlanta with this. And the PPP opponents were saying that you can't build anything within 10 miles of this road. And in fact, if you actually looked at the agreement, you could build a new arterial or even a new freeway 10 feet away from the existing road. You just couldn't add lanes to this new high, this highway. And I would tell you that a stretch of this freeway is 15 general purpose lanes of the widest stretch in the country. So it's unlikely that GDOT was considering adding more general purpose lanes to it. So uh, just, just something to keep in mind. Arterial networks are the next thing. And I want to talk a lot about arterial networks because they're really the backbone. But they're quite unsexy in terms of the transportation uh, overall picture. And they don't often get the publicity and the attention that they need. And some metro areas, if you're from Los Angeles, some metro areas have very good arterial networks. And then if you're from a place like Boston and Atlanta, you don't have our good arterial networks at all. And arterials are often referred to as the surface streets, the ones with traffic lights as well. Um, they provide redundancy in, tra in uh, travel options. They're relatively low cost to improve, at least compared to the freeways, cost being relative in transportation. And so what we did was we divided the arterials into two different types, what we called regional primary arterials and what we called all other arterials. The regional primary arterials are basically have multiple parts. They have, and in order to improve them cost effectively, this was what we found were the easiest things to do. We put in some variable traffic signal synchronization, which means actually when you're driving along the road in the main direction, you get a green light. This is something that's actually fairly, sim fairly easy to do um, if you've got some good traffic engineers with ITS, but often does not happen for political reasons. Um, we looked at putting in queue jumps, which is priority signals um, to improve bus and BRT service. Um, access management, restricting your turns, and then grade separations, which is putting in intersections for your busiest areas. And if you are, you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about, here are some nice pictures of all of those. So, and as you can, as you can see, uh, if you ever see a nice stretch of green lights like this, let me know because I'd like to drive down the street. But in principle, that's what it should be looking at. I also want to talk a little bit about managed arterials, which is a concept that Bob actually came up with. And this is something that for your busy arterials, your ones with six lanes that are congested, thank you, uh, you really want to use. Um, and you really want to utilize because it's a cost-effective way to improve them. And how it usually works is you pay a small fee to use the overpass or underpass to bypass congested intersections. And the studies in Fort Myers have shown it's actually got a high feasibility. Um, you can see that you've got a small optional toll, and I say small in you know, comparison to urban areas, of 25 to 50 cents. And like managed lanes, they are completely optional. So I understand that the truckers may not be real interested in paying a fee because it increased your cost. And that's fine. You don't have to. This is just an option for folks who want to use it. We don't want to force anyone to use it. There is a way to go through the intersection. It's just an idea of saving delay, or cutting down delay. And I should add, in some metro areas that have good arterial networks, such as Miami, such as Los Angeles, this is an excellent solution that really we think should be implemented more. In Atlanta, because our arterial network is so backward, we're sort of limited in what we can do. But I'd really like to use more of it if I can. But again, so again, here is a map of the Atlanta arterial network. You can see generally what we tried to do, and you can see the freeways on there, is we tried to have an alternative to each major freeway so that if the freeway was congested, if there is an accident, if there is a problem, you can use these. And I can also add that coming up with the managed lane network will provide an alternative on the freeway. Because if there's congestion in the general lanes, if there's an accident, 
you have an alternative, whereas right now you have no alternative. So with the managed lanes, with the arterial network, you're actually going from zero alternatives to at least two. Now hopefully you're in a metro area where you actually have some good alternatives now, um, and then maybe you'll be going from two to four or something along those lines. But again, a relatively cost-effective cost way to improve it. I want to talk a little bit about ITS. Now, I don't want to say I'm skeptical about ITS, but oftentimes the ITS folks sort of get in their own world and they're like, we can solve cancer with ITS. And the reality is it's really not quite that good. But I do think they can be very cost effective, and I think they're particularly helpful on arterials and transit. And when I say that, I'm talking about these ideas like synchronizing light signals, like making sure that you're actually improving the traffic flow as much as you can. And I put in here, the challenge in 2013 is not actually to use traffic cameras. Many of you probably have a cell phone, and you can go to Google Maps, and you can see that it will tell you the road is either green, yellow, or red, based on the flow of traffic. Well, that's wonderful. But you, the idea is actually to solve traffic congestion, not just tell you when it's there. And so the idea is with these new ITS systems, what we want to do is we actually want to use the technology to actually improve the flow of traffic, to cut down on congestion. So instead of sticking a Band-Aid on a problem, we're actually solving the problem. I also want to talk a little bit about transit. Now, transit from a market-oriented viewpoint is always challenging because we don't believe in subsidies to transit. We want user pay, user benefits. But obviously, for various reasons, that's not always realistic. So what we did in Atlanta is we maybe considered some existing rail stations, but we we're said, look, we're not going to do, thank you very much, you know, change her here. We're not going to do any new rail because it's not cost effective, especially in Atlanta. Some of you have heard me say Atlanta's the least dense metro, major metro area in the world. And uh, it, it's not a good fit. But we did look at local bus routes. We looked at express bus routes. We looked at bus rapid transit. I think one of the things to keep in mind with a lot of these new buses is you can do transit much more realistically and cost effectively. And you can, all, you can actually create a network and sort of a hierarchy. So if you're going from one neighborhood to the other, you're looking at your local. If you're going more across town, you're looking at express bus and BRT. And you can do all of the functions that rail has in most metro areas at a much smaller percentage of the cost. And if we can just get over this idea that buses are ugly and hideous and, and whatever, then we might actually get somewhere with this. Um, we also looked at a mobility management center, which is also not my favorite because it's not really a functioning free market. But in the absence of that in Atlanta, we decided we had to go ahead and do that. We also looked at non-traditional transit. I'm talking here about casual carpools. I'm talking here about um, van pools, demand response in rural transit. It would also be much my preference if we could uh, contract out transit to the private sector. We find that in many situations they're much more effective and much more, um, much more cost efficient. Now obviously there's a good way to do this and there's a wrong way to do this and it's been contracted out in some situations and it hasn't worked. But where it has worked, I think especially in smaller communities, it's a really good alternative. And I think in some cases you can get more transit, which is often what your community may want, depending on your community, at less cost. Um, also, I'm going to breeze through this, but anyway, I talked about competitive bidding. Um, also, time of day and distance-based pricing. This is something, so for example, if I wanted to go to the airport, for example, I'm going to take, let's say I take a bus and train. I normally drive, but let's say I'm, I'm being adventuresome here. The, most of the rate from my, where I live, which is about 35 miles from the airport, is 250. It is in no way realistic at all that it costs you 250 to get to the airport when you drive. And yet, the problem with this 250 is that the service is lousy. And the service only comes every 15 minutes, so I've got a flight to make. I'm not chancing when it comes. So the idea is if you actually charge more what it's worth, which is probably something in the neighborhood of about $7, the trains would come more frequently. More people would use it. You might look at vouchers for your low-income folks to make sure they're not disadvantaged. And you would actually have a better system. One of the problems with the way we do transit in this country is the way we do transit in this country. It's not necessarily all that logical. I wish I had a better definition for you, but we really could do much better than we are. All right, so let me just go ahead and briefly touch on the funding and financing resources. I think that my preference would be mileage-based user fees. I don't think, at least in Georgia and probably in many of your communities, 
you're ready for that. Um, Port Oregon, of all places, has done mileage-based user fees. They might have some motives I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but in the meantime, we're looking at gas taxes. And we're looking at making sure that the gas taxes are spent on highways, making sure that we're using tolling and public-private partnerships to leverage all of the resources we can get. One of the things that we found in Georgia, and this is actually true in many states, so I encourage you to go back to your state and look at this, or uh, I guess if you're, you're not feeling so adventuresome, send me an email and I'll see what I can find, um, to see how much of your gasoline money is spent on transportation. Georgia actually has a constitutional amendment dedicating gasoline spending to transportation. But as we can see, that doesn't necessarily guarantee anything. Um, of the 30 point, I think, 4 cents, only 16.35 of those cents are actually spent on transportation. That's 52%. That would be an additional billion dollars a year spent on, in my opinion, mostly waste that is not being spent on transportation. And you talk about what you could do with that money if you're leveraging it. It's really quite amazing. In Georgia, it goes, 1% goes to the general fund. One of the, there's a, there's a 7.5 cent flat tax and there's a 4% sales tax. 1% of that 4% goes to the general fund. The other are levied by local governments. Um, and so they actually don't have to spend theirs. But um, the local governments spend it on stuff, uh, you know, like, like new, new school buildings, for example, where they don't actually have any teachers in them to teach. It's, it would not be my best definition. Um, go ahead. Oh, I also talked a little bit about these other sources. Again, tolling, I talked about mileage-based user fees, electric cars. I do think for these hybrid and electric vehicles, in order to make sure they pay their fair share, we're going to have to go ahead and do something. That's always a political battle. But if you start now when there's fewer owners as opposed to later, you don't have as much of a, uh, of a constituency group. I want to breeze by this. Um, transit funding, again, challenging. Do you somehow get funding from the Department of Community Affairs? urban development, um, you know, what can you get from value capture, for example, if you use it correctly on a successful line. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you transit funding is easy because it's not. And I'm also not going to say I like general funding or gas tax funding for transit because I don't. But obviously there's some real um, issues as well. Um, they are a little bit about financing actually transit and transportation, public-private partnerships we talked about, um, TIFIA loans, Garvey's, GANs. Now again, these are loans. So you, and, and in some cases bonds, private activity bonds. So you have to have the funds to actually be able to pay them back. So that's important. But I do think that they, again, with value capture, can give you some additional resources that we don't necessarily think about. All right. And I just, my last slide here, I just want to talk. There's the transit financing slide. I just want to talk about the importance of political coalitions. So obviously we're, we're here mostly automobile, fans, not, you know, real, real friendly with transit. The challenge is to go ahead and get our ideas implemented. And there's going to be some people that know a lot more about this than I do talking this afternoon. But just briefly, one of the things you want to do is you want to go ahead and make sure you can get various groups involved and make sure that you can have a campaign that works, make sure that you, you include all these things. And so for that reason, you might need to look at putting in a little more bus transit than you would like to. You might need to look at including some allies like the NAACP that you wouldn't normally do so. But I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to implement these market-based transit components or transportation components, I should say, on a nationwide basis. And to do that from a, little, from a political perspective, often you have to do some things that you wouldn't normally do. All right. Now I am finished. I will put that slide up and I will let you ask your questions after you ask the other panelists.